Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a member today by clicking the Join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. Also, be sure to follow us on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Links are in the video description. And as always, thank you for all your support. This occurred in November 1968 at Camp Pendleton. While infantry training, we had dug in on a very large hill and were expecting an enemy force to attack in the night. I had one Marine with me and to our left were two others about 30 yards away. They were also dug in. We had a steep rock covered area right in front of us. We heard something coming up the side of the mountain. We could hear rocks rolling down the mountain. It came up over the edge and the Marine with me yelled, HALT! It stood up right in front of us about six feet away. I could see the outline of this creature and it was huge. It looked about three and a half feet wide. It had long arms and a pointed head. It was so tall, big and wide. I could see the outline very well but could not make out its features. It made no noise and there was no smell we could detect. It stood there for about one minute and then walked between us and the other Marines. I was terrified at the time and my hair was standing up. I tried not to breathe. I had no idea what to expect from it. After it passed and was out of sight, the four of us made sure we had all seen the same thing. Everyone said they were not going to say a thing. I have never before reported this, but now I know they exist. We also moved out before dawn so we couldn't check for tracks, but I knew there had to be some. This occurred in September 1969 in Humboldt County. I grew up in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. My father also grew up there. He was born in Klamath Falls, Oregon, but grew up in the eastern San Francisco Bay Area. He has a BS in forestry, a master's in zoology, and a PhD in entomology, and worked as a research scientist with the U.S. Forest Service. For most of his 20 to 30 years of service, my father did research on insects that predate timber harvest species in California and Oregon. When he did his research, usually in the summer and fall, my younger brother and I would accompany him into the woods. My father was, and is, a great woodsman, a hunter and fisherman, who taught my brother and myself all about the forests and what type of plants and animals live there. My father was also a man of science, and this is important to note, as will become evident later. At the end of each summer season, my family and some other forestry families would get together and take several weeks of vacation. Most often, we would load canoes and float down the lower 15 to 30 miles of the Klamath River to its mouth. My father and I would fly fish for steelhead during mornings and evenings, and we would spend the hot hours of the day canoeing, exploring, resting, etc. These trips would often take one to two weeks to complete. During one of these trips, I was about eight or nine years old, I think, we made camp on the river bar at the mouth of Tecta Creek. There was a good flat bar there, and at the time of year, the creek was flowing under the sand and appeared dry. One afternoon, while everyone else was napping, my father and I took a walk up the creek bed to see if the creek was flowing on the surface somewhere inland. About 200 yards upstream, the creek did come to the surface and flowed sluggishly through a series of large pools. I remember my dad telling me that these pools were probably full of baby salmon and steelhead waiting for fall rains to allow them to swim down to the main river and out to sea. My dad had a very scientific mind and he would describe natural processes in great detail when we had the patience to listen. As we proceeded inland up the creek, we rounded a bend and entered a long sandy bar on the east side of a long arching pool in the creek. As I looked across the surface of this bar, I saw a set of tracks in the soft sand. These tracks caught my attention because they were very large and the space between them seemed very long. Like if I laid down next to them, they would almost be farther apart than the length of my body. The tracks also seemed to sink a lot deeper into the sand than the footprints of my dad, who is pretty big at six foot two. The tracks began at the water's edge at the lower end of the bar and proceeded diagonally across the bar in a straight line to the far end of the bar. My father, who had never told me any stories of Bigfoot, he would deny the existence of any animal that was unknown until science recognized it. And to my knowledge, I had not heard of any such animal at the time, 
nor had I anything more than a passing interest in these types of things then. But these tracks, their size, gait, and the way they led across the bar in a straight line, they made a funny impression on me. My father was also interested in the tracks. He asked me please not to walk on them or near them, then asked me to sit down while he spent several minutes comparing his foot size to them and trying to match their spacing by walking next to them. He seemed very tense, as if he sensed something or was trying to figure something out. Eventually, I got bored of sitting and got up and followed him. When I finally caught up with him, we were halfway up the bar. He had stopped looking at the tracks and was instead looking intently at the timber ahead at the southern edge of the bar. He was very quiet and tense. I've never seen my father frightened or worried about anything before, or since for that matter, but watching him the way he scanned the surrounding forest so intently made me very nervous and excited. I broke the silence and I began to ask him what he thought made the tracks and what he was trying to see in the trees. He turned around almost jumping a little in surprise and told me to be quiet. Then he looked around some more and started back toward the camp with a quick pace, grabbing me by the hand and saying, These are the tracks of a big bear, son, and we should leave this area alone from now on. Then he told me not to come up the creek alone and not to tell Mama or my brother or any of the others anything about what we saw, that it might worry them or something, and that he would speak no more of this matter, just like that. Well, the older I got, the funnier the incident and those tracks seemed to me. I've hunted for many years and have seen and tracked many animals in the woods since that time and have never seen anything like that since. I asked my father about this incident last year and he was silent and pensive for a long time. Then he told me that he doesn't remember this time or seen anything other than bear tracks. I don't know what we really saw that day, but I do know that it scared my dad and he has never ever spoken to me the way he did on that day or behaved that way since. In Trinity Forest, on June 18, 1970, a seven-and-a-half-foot-tall Bigfoot was seen by Archie Buckley. Archie had hung a fish in a tree as bait and waited in his Volkswagen. After 3 a.m., the moon went down, and then Archie spotted something at the campsite. He swung a light onto a fish which was untouched and still swinging. The light around saw two glowing eyes 100 feet away. They belonged to a seven-and-a-half-foot-tall, dark, hairy Bigfoot that weighed 450 pounds. The next morning, footprints 15 and a half inches long and 6 and a half inches wide were found coming close to where the Volkswagen had been parked. On May 12, 1970, Mr. Clifford Brush shot a Bigfoot four times with a 22 caliber rifle in Butte Creek Canyon near Chico. The creature had been waving its arms and growling at him as he went to get water at his well. After the shooting, it went away making cries of pain. In Basin Gulch, in Trinity National Forest, August 11, 1970, Ben Foster, Jr., Sharon Gordon, and Richard Foster were camping on a fishing trip and had left out a bait of food items for a Bigfoot. Just after 8 p.m., Sharon saw a Bigfoot watching them from a hilltop 150 feet away. Ben approached it to within 75 feet, and the boy and the Bigfoot watched each other for a few moments, and when Ben approached closer, the Bigfoot tossed a rock at him. The rock landed seven feet to his left while the creature retreated up a ravine. Half an hour later, Ben and Richard walked up the track looking for the Bigfoot and Sharon saw another Bigfoot about 30 feet away. Sharon tried to start the car motor and the creature took off. During the night, the group saw forms of creatures and at least four pairs of bright red glowing eyes in the darkness. There were several other sightings that night and huge footprints were found as well. The Bigfoot were described as 8 to 10 feet tall, weighing 500 to 800 pounds, heavily built with egg-shaped heads, no hair on the faces, and small eyes beneath a heavy brow ridge. The boys saw dark-colored creatures, while the one Sharon saw was light-colored. Up until the 10th of August 1970, tracks, a dead fawn, and feces were found in the area. The car antenna had been flipped by the creature as well. Over several nights in April 1970, Buzz McLaughlin and several others saw a bad-smelling, nine-foot-tall Bigfoot from a ranch school window in Hyumpum. It was described as like a giant gorilla. Previously around here in 1964, a Bigfoot had shaken the car of the witness near Blue Lake, and in 1968, a family saw a Bigfoot at Trinity River near Salyer. 
and these were not all of the reports from this area. This occurred in August 1970 at the McLeod campsite on Lake Shasta. It was before I knew how to drive, so I don't recall highways and such. I have no idea if McLeod is still there. It was pretty popular then, though, but not overcrowded. For all I know, it could be a huge hotel and casino by now. I hope not. It was quite rustic at the time I was there in 1970. I was on a family camping trip. There were a lot of us. I was 13 at the time, and I never heard of Bigfoot. The way our camp was laid out was that all of the girls, two sisters, their friends, and a friend of mine were all staying in one big army tent. My brother and his friend were in a smaller tent off to the east, closer to the drop-off to the lake. Then my parents were in their own tent at the far west end of the campsite. There had been a lot of trouble with bears that summer, so all campers were advised to hang their food high up in the trees. My dad did, and I remember him standing under the bag of food, a good three feet over his head, about ten to fifteen feet from the door to our tent to the left. My dad was five foot ten, and as for myself, I really wanted to see a bear. I was a very outdoorsy kid and would have preferred to sleep outside of the tent, actually. I had little fear of the dark or the night, and it was my goal to see a bear. I'm quite sure we were there for two weeks that year, and as I remember, my sighting occurred about a week in to be in there. I slept closest to the door, and sometime during the middle of the night, I heard a little stirring outside. Everyone else was asleep, and I didn't wake anyone, since I had already been informed, emphatically, that no one else wanted to see a bear. I very quietly and carefully crawled to the door of the tent, and cautiously stuck my head out the door. I looked over to where the food bag was hanging, and saw something that was unquestionably not a bear. What I saw was two dark, hairy creatures just standing there under the food bag, like they were negotiating how to get it down or something. One of them was a good foot taller than the other. My dad would have come to the bottom of the chest of the biggest one. They were just huge. The smaller one was probably just a head taller than my dad. I had that as a gauge, after all, since I had seen my dad standing there in that very spot under the bag, and he hung the food bag in the same place every night. They were very tall and very upright, I had never heard of a Bigfoot at that time, but I knew these were not bears. Bears are pear-shaped and standing upright isn't a position of comfort for them. For that matter, they just don't stand next to each other like they're carrying on a conversation. The incident took place very quickly. It was fast, but I was very impressed, and it was so clear to me immediately that I was seeing something extraordinary. What happened was that as I saw them and saw that they were something unexpected, I did one of those surprise intakes of breath. A true gasp, I guess you would say. They heard that and both turned and looked at me. Then they turned and looked at each other, looked back at me again, and then they were gone. They made not a sound. One moment they were there, and then they were not. I did not get out of the tent. I did think about it, but I laid awake all night thinking about it. As I absolutely had no idea what I'd seen... The next morning, the first thing I did was go in the direction I saw them leave to see if I could find tracks, but the earth was very dry and hard there. I didn't see anything. It might be that someone more skilled than I at the time might have found some trace, but I didn't. I did spend a goodly amount of remainder of that vacation watching and walking in the woods. I recall I even passed on water skiing a few times to go search the woods. I didn't tell anybody what I saw until a few years later. I told no one at the time. I was the youngest in the family and already endured a considerable amount of teasing on a regular basis. You know, kid stuff. I wasn't about to go tell anybody that I saw a seven and a half foot tall, hairy man-like creature in the campsite. It would not have gone off well. What I saw of them? Hairy, with long, hanging brown to black hair. I didn't catch any gender features. I just assumed the smaller one was female but I have no reason to think that since I was mostly just seeing their height. And the fact that they looked at me, they looked at me. Those just aren't words. I did catch that the arms were quite long and that they were very big in the chest, shoulders, and upper arms, not so much in the hips. Nope, these were not bears at all. I don't recall if there was any strong scent associated with my sighting. I didn't know what I saw until a year or so later when I saw a picture of the famous movie footage. I was so excited to see something that looked like what I had seen. There was a strangeness about it all, like it just seemed staged or something. If they had been standing anywhere else, I would have not had such a clear gauge of their height and bigness. 
They were standing there like they were waiting for something to happen. I did not have the impression that they were interested in the food bag itself, but they were standing directly under it. Do I think it was people in hairy outfits standing in our campsite in the middle of the night? No. But it did feel strangely like a staged event. That has always been a mystery to me. I believe the year was 1970. I was 12 years old or so. My friend and I belonged to the Western Conservation Club and went on many outings with the group. We would work in an area, cleaning it up and restoration for half our stay and play the other half. My friend and I decided that we were going to walk way up the creek to go fishing, more to get away from the adults than anything else, though. It was mid-afternoon when we started out. The area had very few trails once you left the immediate camping area. We headed out cross-country, staying as close to the creek as possible, looking for good fishing holes. We'd walked about five miles up the creek toward the mountains when we both got the feeling that we were being watched. We both looked at each other and called each other lightweights and kept on going. We fished for a while. By now, it was late afternoon. We noticed that there were none of the usual sounds that you hear in a forest, such as birds, etc. We still had that feeling of being watched. The sky was starting to look threatening as an afternoon storm was heading down the canyon and creek towards us. We started back to the camp when the storm caught us and lightning started. A bolt of lightning struck the ground on the other side of the creek and up away from our location. Directly afterwards, we heard a growling or grunting sound from the area of the strike. We heard the sound of branches breaking in the bush. The sound was moving up the creek away from us and up the mountain. The breaking branches sounded as if they were high up in the trees. The trees in the area were conifers and the dead branches started about six or more feet up the trees from ground level. So whatever was breaking the branches had to be pretty tall. The object was moving fast because it was soon out of hearing distance. You know as well as I that sound travels a long way in the woods, and we were in a canyon, so the object was really moving. We never noticed a foul smell or saw anything conclusive. I did, however, see a large shadow moving through the woods briefly. Please understand that although we were very young, we had a lot of experience in the backcountry. We knew what the indigenous animals looked like, their habits and sounds they make. This growling did not sound like anything I'd ever heard before or since. I know that this will sound funny, but a person knows when things aren't quite right, and this was not right. Just a feeling. We could not return to the area to look for footprints as the lightning strike caused a fire and the campsite was evacuated by the Forest Service. At the time I had heard about Bigfoot, but only up north. I was unaware of local sightings until recently. This was not a bear. I thought that at the time I tried to make it a bear so I could put the incident out of mind but it just didn't add up that it was a bear unless this bear was huge, walking erect, and hauling butt. It also didn't sound like any bear noises that I had ever heard, not that I'm a bear expert or anything. During February 1971, in and around Alpine in San Diego County, a family that lived at the end of a desolate road reported seeing bizarre, hairy creatures of different heights prowling the area at night. They were accompanied by a strong pungent odor resembling rotten garbage. One of the creatures was about seven feet tall, the smaller one five feet, and the little one three or four feet tall. The report had it that the hairy creatures seemed to mimic human speech with their voice sounding very guttural. The main witness, a Dr. Badur, insisted on calling the creatures Zubies and speculated that they were interdimensional in nature. During August 1971, Warren Johnson, his brother Lewis, and several friends experienced many unusual experiences above Strawberry in Tulum County. They often found footprints, heard moans, grunts, snarls, snorts, tooth popping, and chest beating. Lewis Johnson also reported that he had looked out through a hole in the shelter wall, saw a shape enter a patch of moonlight, and leave again as soon as he tried to call someone's attention to it. Johnson estimates the size at 10 feet tall, four feet across the shoulders, and as much as 750 pounds. Tracks were found that were 22 inches in length and had a five-foot stride. The area was pine forest at about 6,000 feet elevation. At Balls Ferry on January 21, 1972, four teenage boys were in a car on their way to Battle Creek to fish when a UFO was seen to swoop the car. The boys then parked at Battle Creek Bridge, and whilst there, heard an odd scream coming from the bush. 
John, 16, flashed a light over in the bush and illuminated a seven-foot-tall, hairy humanoid with teardrop-shaped ears and lumps all over its body. It turned and ran, so did the witnesses. The boys headed back to their car, but to their horror, the car would not start. They had to push-start the car. The hairy humanoid seemed to actually be wearing a uniform with lump-like pouches on the front like a kangaroo's pouch. Afterwards, Darrow saw fireworks going off on pavement without sound. Then all the witnesses saw blue, white, orange, and red fiery objects move erratically in the open fields. One glowing ball assumed human shape on the side of the road. It was too much for the boys, and they fled the scene. At Palmdale during July 1972, a witness drove into his carport one evening. There was total silence, and the witness saw a large bush that was swaying, as well as a rotten odor coming from it. There was no breeze, though. When the witness realized that the bush was actually a hairy Bigfoot, the witness fled inside and looked out of a window. He was paralyzed and felt controlled. The Bigfoot was 50 feet away and 9 feet tall, and the witness felt an urge to go to it. Both the witness and the Bigfoot stared at each other. What happened after this is unknown. This occurred in July 1972 at Papoose Lake. A tremendous storm came in off the Pacific. My friend and I took shelter in a plastic tube tent. About midnight, we heard a large animal walking around our camp. The animal had two legs, not four. The animal had soft feet, not hooves. The animal was walking through brush and the forest floor. The weight of the animal was breaking branches that, from the sound of it, were at least one inch in diameter. The animal walked around our campsite screaming for most of four hours. The screams were blood-curdling and almost human, but louder and unlike any animal I was familiar with. I have hiked the Trinity Alps all my life. I know the trails and the environment intimately. This was not a bear. I've heard and seen dozens of them and chased lots of them out of camp. This was not a deer. I've seen hundreds of them and had them step over me at night when I camped on a trail. This animal had two legs. The difference between a four-legged and two-legged gait is easily distinguished. This animal was very heavy and was breaking large branches as it walked, but it had no hooves. This was not a mountain lion. I've had them follow me and I've heard them scream. Mountain lions do not snap branches. We were in the only stand of trees for miles in any direction. The animal took shelter in that stand of trees and spent the night with us, walking around our camp and screaming all night. I am certain it was frightened as the wind was breaking large branches and there was a lot of lightning and thunder. At some moments, it was no more than 20 feet away, but it was too dark to see that far and no way we were going to turn on a flashlight. It was truly frightening. I was 16 at the time, but I was used to facing down mountain lions and chasing bears out of camp with a spoon and a plate. This animal was terrifying. In the morning, we looked for prints or signs, but a wet forest floor over granite is the worst surface, and we found nothing. We headed back the 14 miles to the car at top speed. I have hiked the Trinity Alps on over 300 trips during my life. I have never gone back to that lake. I believe the intense storm drove it to seek shelter near us, or it would never have spent so much time in that proximity to humans. The Trinity Alps are full of stories. I have continued to hike, fish, and hunt that wilderness area for the last 28 years since then and have had no other contact. During mid-January 1973, at 7.30 a.m., on the road between Grants Pass and Eureka, a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot stepped into the path of a logging truck, which ended up severely damaged. The creature was six foot six inches tall, reddish-haired, with a domed head like a human's, but with no neck and the arms were very long, with the hands reaching down to the knees. The creature appeared not to be aware of the truck, which hurled it off the left shoulder of the road. By the time the truck stopped, the creature was gone, and there was no traces of blood or hair in the damaged areas. During 1972, I was hiking down from a lake with my dad and my friend on a fishing trip. We were at a place called Barney Lake and on our way home. I was the lead person. I had outpaced both my friend and my dad by about four minutes without knowing it as I was moving quickly downhill. After about 10 to 40 minutes from the lake down, I can't remember all these years, I finally came to a clearing. It was a small, flat, grassy meadow. I took a break and looked out over the meadow. The first thing I saw was a big white boulder near the end of the meadow, 
and there was maybe twenty yards or thirty yards of grass here. At the point of the clearing to my left, I heard extreme thrashing going on. I look to my left, and I see a huge animal bent over with its rear end facing me. It was only about twelve feet away from me. I saw that it was hairy and had reddish-orange-brown multicolored mixed hair, and most different was its rear end that was bare like a monkey. I knew this because during this time of my life, I'd spent all my lunch hours in the library reading about zoology and marine biology. I thought this was very strange at first, as no bear can bend like this at the waist and have skin over the rear area. I was frozen in fear and shocked and bewildered at the same time. I had never known or heard of Bigfoot or Sasquatch at this time in my life. At this point, it had been only five or six seconds, and then the animal lifted up and stood erect. It was enormous. It must have been eight feet tall or more, which to a ten-year-old is unreal. It had been scratching with its hands, grubbing and digging for what I thought was food. Its back was to me, and when I saw it stand, I saw it was built in the same way as humans are, with a lot of hair. I knew this was no bear from my background, and I also know only black bear were seen as an almost extinct species here and would have been much smaller in height and stature. I got so scared I ran full pack toward that big white rock. I literally dove over the top, pack and all, and when I landed, snuggled against the rock, too scared to even look, in case the creature had heard me. Finally, after about twenty seconds or so, I peeked over the rock to see nothing and no one on the trail. Within one or two minutes, my dad and John came down the trail into the opening, and I started to scream at them, in fear that the creature was still there and would do something. They froze bewildered and looked left and then at me in confusion. I finally came out and walked to them and looked into the trees and thick brush to see nothing but broken brush and twigs with some hair there. We moved on finally, and I never spoke of this again except my dad and a couple of close friends. Eight years later, I saw the Bigfoot movie and the Patterson video. Once I saw this, I knew without a doubt this was what I saw. I will never forget this and take it to my grave. I know what I saw was no figment of my imagination or hoax. In Lancaster in March 1973, at 2.30 a.m., Miss Kim Hawkins, a 19-year-old young lady, was scared into hysterics by a giant monster rising up out of a field that also wounded two dogs. This was east of town, just off Avenue J. Kim got out of her car expecting her dogs to greet her, but instead she heard a whining plaintive noise from behind the trailer. It was a full moon, and the being rose up to eight feet high from the tall grass and ran away. The creature was completely covered with hair. Also in March of 73, a UFO with flashing green and white lights was seen hovering over a telephone pole in front of the Baylor house by 12 children from ages 16 years down. The witnesses saw an iron cable or hose being lowered down to touch the electricity cables. The UFO resembled two plates put together with a dome on top and had no wings and it made a high-pitched humming noise and was a half an acre in size. The craft hovered for 15 minutes before suddenly taking off in the direction of the microwave tower on top of the butte to the east. Same area, same time as Kim's sighting. At Big Rock in the San Gabriel Mountains, on April 22, 1973, three teenagers were camping. It was their third night there, and one of them kept inventing reasons for leaving, which was unusual for him. He left in the only transport, which was his 1953 Chevy pickup. As he was driving past Sycamore Flats campground, he thought that he glimpsed something huge and dark near the campground entrance. The two friends were in the back of the truck and could not believe their eyes. From the campground had emerged a tremendous figure, loping easily down the center of the road behind them and matching the 20 miles per hour speed of the truck. The light from the full moon was behind it. The creature had a conical head and no neck and was 11 feet tall. The trio went back the following morning and footprints were found there that were 19 inches long and with only three toes. There were five other reports that week of the same sort of creature. Meanwhile, nearby in Lancaster in April 1973, John Parkhurst, a high school student, was driving down Avenue J to his parents' ranch one morning when he thought he saw one of the burned black trees that lined the road on his right move. Then one of the trees took a large step and stood in the middle of the road. It was actually a hairy Bigfoot with a peaked head shaped like a bullet that sloped down into massive shoulders. 
It had a small head in proportion to its bulky body, which was covered with black hair. Rather than turn its head to look at the car approaching at 55 miles per hour, it turned its entire full upper torso and then took one more massive step and cleared the road and went out into the desert. Footprints were found that were 18 inches long with five toes and eight inches across the top and six inches across the heel. At Mojave, near Antelope Valley, in July 1973, Mike Pence was riding his motorbike when he stopped near an old mine and turned off the motor. Instantly, an immense rock was thrown at him that nearly missed his back tire. Pence looked up and saw an immense black hairy thing that was manlike and standing on a butte with its arms raised overhead ready to throw another boulder. Mike retreated as more boulders were thrown at him. In the San Gabriel Mountains in July 1973, John Baylor, John Bailey, and other men were climbing a canyon trying to find a Bigfoot. Joyce Baylor and the women were left in cars below. The men heard scuffling sounds ahead of them and retreated as rocks were thrown at them from above. At the same time, John Baylor felt his mind was controlled by the creature commanding him to lay down his gun. The men reached the car park, but Joyce had gone with the car. She had fled when a giant being emerged from behind some bushes and passed slowly in front of the vehicle. The creature's head was visible above 10 to 12 foot tall sycamore trees. The next morning, giant footprints were found that were helter-skelter all over the place. In Lancaster in July 1973, at 10 a.m., Brett Baylor and Stephanie Baylor, his sister, were walking down a dirt road when they glanced up on Lovejoy Butte. Brett suddenly yelled out, there was a brown ape-like creature on the butte with white hair around its face and a pointed head. There was hair all over its body, and the creature was looking at them from around a boulder. At Kingsbury Grade in El Dorado County, on July 29, 1973, at 8.30 p.m., two couples were in a car southeast of Lake Tahoe when they thought they saw a black bear on its hind feet on the side of the road. The bear vanished into the bushes and, before it turned, looked at the witnesses. The creature was not a bear. It had a flat face like a gorilla, was seven to eight feet tall, and was very shiny. The beast's body was well proportioned, but it had a small head with a face that was leathery. It took long steps with a smooth, swinging gait. After a while, it walked into the bush. In August of 1973, I had a terrible experience on a camping trip. I lived in Oakland, California at the time, and my boyfriend John and I decided to take a long weekend camping trip in the Sierra Nevada mountains. We took Highway 4 until we got to Ebbets Pass, which is about eight to 9,000 feet high and close to the Nevada border. At that altitude, the road was very narrow and not well maintained. We were in a very lonely place and encountered no other traffic. The place we chose to camp was on a granite outcrop on a mountainside that had just enough thin soil to put tent stakes in. The granite was bisected by the highway. The mountain sloped away to a meadow beneath us and some sparse forest. On the other side of the road was a single line of young pines, and then the mountain rose steeply from there. It was all loose gravel and rocks and boulders because we were right at the timber line. By the time it was dark, we already had the tent up and a fire going. John took a flashlight and went to the meadow below because he said we needed more wood. I was sitting by the fire feeling utterly miserable with a raging cold that took over during the trip. After about ten minutes of sitting by myself, I became aware of something circling the campfire, taking care to stay beyond the circle of light so I could not see what it was or who it was. Occasionally, I could hear a stealthy footfall or a twig snap. Then I could hear very low, soft, guttural breathing noises. Whatever it was, it kept circling and I got very frightened. I took up a branch with fire on the end, and as it circled the fire, I turned, followed its direction, holding the branch out like a weapon. I never did see anything. I yelled for John, and there was no answer. It occurred to me that whatever or whoever was circling the fire had gotten John. A few minutes later, John showed up, and I told him what happened. We thought it was a bear. I must say here that John was not the type to pull practical jokes. We had hot dogs for dinner, which I couldn't taste or smell because of my raging cold. After about two hours at our campsite, other travelers arrived. They had one of those vans that had an awning that pulled out for camping. They camped about 40 to 50 feet away from us, setting up a table and chairs. 
I think they chose the place because we were already there and it was impossible to find anything else in the dark. At that time, there were no campgrounds in the vicinity, at least to my knowledge. We politely ignored each other and we settled down for the night in our tent. The ground was very hard and uncomfortable. I don't know how long we had been asleep, but I was awakened by the most blood-curdling sound I had ever heard. If you can imagine combining the roars of an elephant and an African lion, you are close to describing this sound. Then I heard heavy thump, thump, thump sounds. It was reverberating in the granite beneath us. The roars continued and it was getting closer. I realized the thumping sounds were the footsteps of the creature, and then it dawned on me with horror that the footsteps sounded bipedal. The other campers heard it too, and they threw everything into their van and burned rubber getting out of there. Whatever it was, it was coming closer and closer, and it seemed to me to be enraged. I was so frightened that I was shaking uncontrollably, and tears were streaming down my face. I tried to get John to start the car, and he wouldn't budge. It occurred to me later that John was petrified with fear. Rocks were rolling down the mountain slope, and we could hear timber snapping. We could also hear low growling noises. It got to the road directly opposite us, and we could hear loud cracking noises, and then a lone car appeared on the highway, its lights scaring off whatever it was. It ran up the mountain, roaring and raged, the ground beneath us vibrating with its every running step. We stayed up the rest of the night, and it never came back. I tried to get John to leave, but he refused. The next morning, we did see a black bear that went ambling past us, completely indifferent to us. I had the presence of mind to look for footprints, but found none. However, a young pine across the road from us, which was about 10 to 12 feet tall, had been broken off at about 3 feet up from the roots. Five years later, in 1978, I was persuaded to tell my story to someone introduced to me by the name of George, who lived in Oakland. George told me that he had been researching Bigfoot for many years. When I told him what happened, he asked if I happened to be having my period at the time of the trip. I replied yes, and he told me that a Bigfoot had been attracted to us because of that. He believed everything I said and told me my experience was a classic Bigfoot encounter or words to that effect. I did not stay in touch with George, and I don't know what happened to him. This experience was really frightening, and I would rarely talk of it. I have seen documentaries about Bigfoot, and this made me recall my experience. In September 1974, Neil Form and Rich Engels were at the eastern end of Avenue J. It was a moonless night, and the boys were searching for footprints of a Sasquatch. During this, they noticed a small pile of rocks in a neat pyramid fashion that was centered on a large flat rock. At the same time, both boys felt watched. Forn then saw a dark form standing in the torchlight on the crag above them. It was a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot with a lean build and shaggy black hair covering its body. Its head was conical. The man-beast ducked behind some boulders. Later, unusual three-toed footprints were found. This happened near Yosemite in the High Sierras in September 1973. The thing I saw was probably over six feet. It had grayish hair, big eyes, and it was something I did not enjoy seeing. I was deer hunting during the midweek. There was no one in the area except my dog and me. I had sat down to eat my lunch, looking towards the north. I had finished eating. My dog and I headed back to my pickup to continue hunting. As I approached my truck... My dog became alert and started running around my truck that was facing west. I tried to get my dog under control, but was unable to get her attention, and that's when she jumped in the back of my pickup and jumped out. As she ran to the front of my pickup, I looked at the direction she was barking, and I saw this creature on a rock about 50 yards from us. Thinking it was a bear, I put my rifle up to look at it through the scope. When I put the scope up on the creature, it turned its head and looked directly at me. I saw that it had grayish fur, its eyes were larger than a bear's, and it did not have a snout like a bear. My dog then jumped up on the hood of my pickup, barking continuously. After I fired two shots of a 7mm magnum into the air, I opened the door of my pickup, me and my dog jumped inside and left. My comments are that I know what I saw, and what I saw was no animal that I've ever seen anything like it, and I know what I saw was not a bear. At Big Rock in 1974, four witnesses heard a strange whistling noise. 
Richard Engels answered it with an imitation of the call, and then the whistling came closer. The witnesses then saw a pair of glowing red eyes ten feet from the ground, and the female witness screamed and Engels ran towards the hairy hominoid with a flashlight and a camera in his hand. There were no tracks and no creature. At Little Rock in 1974, Andrew Stone and Hilda Stone and their infant son Michael were settling into a cabin, and the child started screaming when placed under the window. Next evening, Pooley the dog went wild and vanished outside and was never seen again until its dismembered body was found near a water tank. Soon after, a large catch of fish left outside also vanished mysteriously. They were hung at a 12-foot level on a telephone pole. Immense three-toed footprints were found and screams were heard in the San Gabriel Mountains like a woman screaming. One night, a Bigfoot hit the side of the cabin very hard. Bigfoots would come and drink out of the overflow of the water tank, and Andrew saw red eyes in his flashlight beam. Three toed tracks were found. They were up to 19 inches long with no arch. The man beasts had long and stringy hair that was a dirty white color. They had deep set eyes and two fangs coming from the top jaw and two from the bottom. They had flat noses and large breasts and ran up the hill on two legs. They were also strong and smelly, like goat or possum urine, and also threw rocks on the roof of the cabin. I was camping with my friend and her family in Big Sur, California. My friend Sylvia and I were sitting on the sand near the beach. I looked up at the cliffs and I saw something big and black running down a very steep mountainside, very fast, and not losing its balance. I yelled at my friend to look, and she saw it. We ran as fast as we could back to the safety of our camp. I remember we were scared to death, and we told her aunt and uncle. I remember we said it looked like a big gorilla. We were kind of far away from the mountain, but it looked like the creature could have caught up to us really fast if it wanted to. It was quite a scary experience. It seems like a dream now, but I know what I saw. It looked humanly impossible for someone or something to run down a jagged mountain cliff that fast without losing its balance. It was around 11 a.m. and sunny with no clouds. In October 1974, two teenage boys reported seeing a large, hairy, seven-foot-tall creature running through a ranch area near Saugus in Los Angeles County. It was carrying a pig under its arm. It was odd, though, that the creature was also apparently wearing a glowing blue belt. Numerous reports of UFOs were seen in that area. On a Saturday in October 1974, Jim Mangano, 17, and six companions were camping. Mangano left the group to be alone for a while and sat on a large rock. After one hour, he felt that he was in a trance. Later, he returned to the campsite before going back up to the meditation spot. Jim was very frightened by now and felt compelled. He had been gone for two hours. At midnight, Jim heard a scream like a boy being murdered from the meditation spot. One of the other witnesses heard the screams as well. The next morning, he found a single footprint, 19 inches long, with only three toes. In summer of 1974, at California Pines, an area bordered on three sides by the Modak National Forest, I purchased an acre of land. To get to the property, which was located many miles from civilization, you had to travel on a very rough road, one cut with a dozer, so our motorhome could not make it to our lot. Nearby was a small pond and a campsite that was for the use of property owners. The pond was about 75 to 100 feet across, the banks were covered in cattails, and the pond was full of trout. My family, wife, son, and two daughters, were aware of how quiet it was in the evening. We couldn't even get a station on the radio. We built a campfire, and we were sitting around it watching the field mice run down to the edge of the pond to get a drink. As I remember, it was a bright night, the moon was visible overhead. Along about 10 or 11, the wife and kids went into the camper and went to bed. I remained outside by the campfire, trying to get a station on the Walkman radio. At 1 a.m. I was putting out the fire when I saw movement on the other side of the pond. I noticed the movement because of the noise this thing was making. At first I thought it was a deer. So with that thought, I headed toward the sound, armed with my trusty flashlight. As I approached, the moonlight was very bright, and I could see lots of movement in the cattails, but could not see the animal. At this point it hit me that maybe it was a mountain lion, because I could hear a low rumbling sound like a cat purring, but much louder. I decided to return to the motorhome. As I turned to retrace my steps, I was probably 50 feet from the noise, 
this huge, hulking figure stood up in front of me and made a loud screeching noise. It raised itself up to a full standing position, I would say seven or eight feet tall, with dark brownish hair. We looked at each other for a moment, and then I turned and ran full speed away from him. When I looked back to see if he was following me, he was walking in the opposite direction toward the deep forest. I stood and watched him until he disappeared. He didn't walk like an animal, but more like a man. When I composed myself, I went back to the area I saw him to look for tracks, but all I found was crushed cattails. An area about ten foot in diameter was all smashed down, and it smelled like strong urine in the area. I told the family what I saw, and to this day, they think I saw a deer or some other animal. I tell this story now to my grandchildren when we go camping. The one thing that stuck with me about this encounter was after the event was over, I felt that whatever it was did not seem threatening, but just as startled as I was. Thanks for listening. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member by clicking the join button below this video. Member perks include two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways, members-only polls, photos and status updates, and more. We hope to see you as a member soon, and thanks for all your support.